I love coffee, and there is a good chance that you do too. But have you ever looked at that brown liquid in your cup and wondered the journey it had to take to end up there? And by that I don't mean the literal travel from the plantation to your kitchen, but the historical and cultural journey. If not, don't worry, I'm a curious man, so I did the research for you and was blown away with what I found out. Accidental discovery, fear of the devil, slavery, revolutions, and many more more things, all propelled by this simple looking seed. So without further ado, this is the history of coffee and how it traveled the world. But first, let's see how we discovered coffee. As I have said many times for similar things in the past, we don't know. There are many legends and stories surrounding the discovery of coffee, so I'll tell you the one I like the most. It's story time. The legend says that there was this goat herder in Ethiopia called Kaldi, who noticed that his goats tended to be more active when they consumed the red berries of a bush. And because he probably never heard that curiosity killed the cat, he decided to try the berries himself and noticed that, first, they tasted like shit, and second, he also felt energized. He later brought the berries to his local monastery, where the monks, in typical religious fashion, decided that it was a fruit of the devil, and threw the berries to the fire. There, the coffee beans roasted and the delicious aroma attracted their attention. They pulled them from the fire and decided, you know what would be a good idea? To put them in water and drink them. Because curiosity, again, is greater than the unknown. But in any case, this resulted, according to the legend, in the first cup of coffee ever produced. We know for a fact that the coffee plant we know originated from Ethiopia, so at least that part of the legend is 100% correct. And in the 6th century, Ethiopia invaded the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, taking their love for coffee along with them and advancing the plot for this video. If we move a couple of centuries forward, coffee has spread across all of the Arabian Peninsula and it is used in religious ceremonies for its alertness inducing properties. It is in this part of the world where we start to see the first coffee houses in history appear all across the Ottoman Empire. They were called, um, this, which I know I couldn't pronounce even if I tried. Those first coffee houses were places where people from all walks of life gathered and enjoyed music, watched performers, played games, and discussed current events. This could easily be the first example of coffee culture in the world. These coffee houses were a place for community and information sharing, and were sometimes referred to as schools of the wise. And this nature is what, in 1511, drove the governor of Mecca to ban coffee houses and coffee in general, because he feared these were brewing places of radical thinking. The ban was short-lived, and it was lifted in 1524 by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman the Magnificent, so they went on to brew just coffee instead of revolution. And thanks to trading with the Ottomans, which is ironic because they were mortal enemies, the Republic of Venice was one of the first places in Europe where coffee made an appearance. Ottoman traders showed Venetian merchants the enchantments of coffee, and they in turn shared it with the elite of Venice who ended loving the drink. Because who wouldn't? Coffee is life. Coffee is love. But you know who didn't think coffee was love? The clergy. Thanks to its Islamic origin, they were afraid of it and considered it the devil's drink for the second time in history. They actually presented the issue to Pope Clement VIII so they could ban it throughout the Christian world, but being a man of reason, he decided to try it out before making such decision. And look at that! He loved it and said something like, Why, this Satan's drink is so delicious that it would be a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. And he followed by blessing the beans to appease his advisors, because that is something popes do. This is another thing we don't know if it really happened, but it's an awesome story. One of many. For some reason, the history of coffee is filled with stories like this. And now with papal approval, the first European coffee house to open was located in Venice in 1645, and they would later spread all over Europe. And spread they did. With the Enlightenment, coffee houses became places of culture, entertainment, politics, current events, and so on. In England, they were known as penny universities, because for the cost of one penny, you could enjoy a cup of coffee and be educated by the intellectuals of the time. 
and this popularity led to some logistic problems. Because you see, coffee only grew in the Ottoman Empire and it was a closed guarded secret. The Ottomans only exported inert seeds to make sure only them could trade with coffee. And being dependent of an empire that is always waging war against you is not good for business. It's not only me thinking that, the Dutch also did. So they managed to steal coffee seeds from Yemen and started their own plantations in Indonesia, making them the first European power to be able to do so in the second half of the 17th century. By the 18th century, the Dutch practically had a monopoly in the European coffee trade and Amsterdam would be the coffee supplier for all those new coffee houses opening across the continent. But that wouldn't last much longer, as the end of the monopoly began with a simple gift. In 1714, the mayor of Amsterdam presented a coffee plant as a gift to King Louis XIV of France, who planted it in the Royal Botanical Garden in Paris. And almost a decade later, in 1723, a man named Gabriel de Clue managed to steal a plant from the royal garden in order for France to enter the coffee business. And this story is crazy from beginning to end. To start, he managed to steal a plant by asking help from a woman that one of the gardeners seemed to have a crush on and couldn't say no to. Later, he boarded a ship to America, where he had to defend the plant from a supposed Dutch spy, who obviously didn't want his nation losing all that monopoly money. After the spy got off the ship in one of the stops, they sailed to the Atlantic, where they were chased by pirates. Luckily, the captain was experienced enough and they managed to lose them. What followed the pirates was a terrible hurricane that laid waste to the ship. They lost the majority of the fresh water and they had to resort to ration what was left. So the clue had to share his own ration of water with the plant. And if that wasn't enough, a dead calm settled right after. There were no clouds, no wind and no waves. It was all stale, which added days to the trip just when they were getting there. He barely managed to get to the island of Martinique, where he was finally able to cultivate his coffee plant. From that salt bush, he was able to get many, many more. By the time he died, there were 18 million coffee plants in Martinique alone. It is said that every coffee plant in America is a descendant from the same plant that Gabriel de Clou brought. Which brings us to another story, this time involving Brazil. In 1727, the king of Portugal, wanting to enter the coffee business, sent Francisco de Melo Paleta to get some French coffee from Guiana. They refused, obviously, but Francisco was not a man that took no for an answer, so taking advantage of his allegedly good looks, he turned to the only possible solution left. He made the governor's wife fall in love with him, because for the second time, apparently, when you can't get what you want, uh, sex is the answer. And when Francisco was to leave Guiana, the governor's wife bid him farewell with a bouquet of flowers, which had a pouch of coffee seeds hidden inside. Francisco then went to Brazil and started Brazil's coffee plantations from the gift he received. For the next hundred years, Brazil production was okay, but nothing to brag about. It wasn't until Brazil's independence from Portugal that the newly formed government decided to ramp up production, coffee being almost half of Brazil's exports by the mid-19th century. But someone has to work the many coffee plantations across Brazil and all of Latin America. And the answer, unsurprisingly, was slavery. Which, I know it's not pretty, but we have to understand that the history of coffee in America is one of brutality against the many indigenous peoples in the region, as well as slaves brought from Africa. The coffee trade was so important that it was partly responsible for Brazil being the last country in America to outlaw slavery in 1888. And not only that, coffee could have inspired revolutions as well, like the Haitian Revolution, which saw the creation of the first nation built by a slave uprising that was free from slavery and governed by non-whites. And also in the newly formed United States, drinking coffee was seen as patriotic because tea was widely associated with the British. In a letter to Edmund Rogers in 1824, Thomas Jefferson even recalled that coffee was the favorite drink of the civilized world. Which, I mean, is pretty remarkable for a plant with such horrible tasting berries. Eventually, with the passing of time, things started to get better in general and there was peace, respect, and... was that? Oh boy, it's World War I. And do you know what one of the essential Russian troops were supplied with was? Instant coffee, which was invented just a couple of years earlier by George Washington. 
Um, not that one. Yeah, that one. It was actually developed multiple times with different processes and by a multitude of people, but yeah, I couldn't pass on Washington. Returning to World War I, coffee was even described by a high-ranking officer as important as beef and bread. And if you get your troops hooked on coffee, it's only fair that when the war ends and they return, they would continue the habit at home. Which is a similar story that happened in World War I's sequel, where stationed troops in Italy found a new love for Italian drinks like espresso, cappuccino and mocha. That's supposedly the origin of the Americano, as American soldiers tended to dilute their espressos with water, so Italians started to call it Café Americano, American coffee. So again, American soldiers returning from the war liked the drink so much that they brought with them a culture of drinking coffee, which made coffee houses in the US rise in popularity. At the beginning of the 1970s, the first Starbucks opened, selling experiences instead of coffee, and the rest is history. Nowadays, it's a thing we just take for granted. We drink it all the time in a multitude of presentations and for different occasions. But the cultural and social impact of coffee cannot be overstated. We use it as a tool to wake us up in the morning, a guilty pleasure to enjoy in the afternoon, an excuse to socialize with others, among many other things. And let's not forget that it has literally changed the face of nations and it has given us a lot of cool stories and legends to go along with its story. Coffee is here to stay. And whenever you're looking at that brown liquid in the morning, just remember that for it to get there, there was a whole story involving goats, pirates and the fear of the devil. And that for sure was the interesting and awesome history of coffee. I really hope that you enjoyed that video. Coffee is something I'm really passionate about, so I hope I could reflect that with this little piece. Let me know down in the comments below if you'd like me to deep dive in more things about coffee. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to know when I do. Man, he history is fascinating. I started researching this thinking it would be a simple story about colonialism, but oh boy was I wrong. This is easily one of the most interesting research I've done for a video. And one of the most difficult edits too. I really try to bite more than I can chew. But anyways, I, I think it's time I end the video, don't you think? So, I hope to see you in the next one. Have a nice day and goodbye.